because I'm gonna I'm gonna carry on and for the next sutta and I want to look at the idea of how to deal with deal with uh, ill will and how to deal with anger and these kind of things because uh, sure so there is all these problems in the world the world is always uh, in the grip of hostility and all kind of problems uh, but is there a way we can reduce this idea of ill will can we have more meta in our life uh, and if this pos and if it is possible then of course we we think it is possible because so much of the buddhist path is about that uh, what are the skillful ways of actually overcoming this ill will in the world, at least to some extent? So we can deepen our meditation, we can let go of the world a little bit, have more metta, and then access deeper meditations as a consequence. So what are these things? And this is a sutta that I read out on every retreat because I think it is such an important sutta. So you will see it coming up here. And this is the famous getting rid of resentment sutta. So uh, I will start this now and then we will continue it afterwards after we have a short break. So let's just uh, get started with this one. A very interesting, this is another sutta by Venerable Sariputta. So you can see how common it is for Venerable Sariputta in the suttas to address the monks and to take the position, almost take the position of the Buddha. If the Buddha is absent, he may not be available, then Venerable Sariputta is always there to give a profound teaching to the monks, to the nuns, to the lay people, whoever is present at the time. So there Venerable Sariputta addressed the monastics or the mendicants or really everyone who is present. Reverends, mendicants, Reverend, they replied, and the Venerable Sariputta said this. Reverends, a mendicant should use these five methods to completely get rid of resentment when it has arisen towards anyone. What five? In the case of a person whose behavior by body is impure, but whose behavior by speech is pure, you should get rid, get rid of resentment for that kind of person. In the case of a person whose behavior by way of speech is impure, but whose behavior by body is pure, you should get rid of resentment for that kind of person. In the case of a person whose behavior by body and speech are impure, but who gets an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time, you should get rid of resentment for that kind of person. In the case of a person whose behavior by body and speech are impure, but who doesn't get an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time, you should get rid of resentment for that kind of person. And in the case of a person whose behavior by body and speech is pure, and who gets an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time, you should get rid of resentment for that kind of person. So these are the five kinds of people, and uh, we should not really have any resentment. The word resentment in this case really is just another way of talking about ill will and anger and irritation and all of these kind of things. Yeah, all of these negative feelings we have about other people. Uh, so all, so these five kinds of people really includes everyone. Yeah. You shouldn't really, there's no need to have resentment towards anyone in the whole world. And uh, this is kind of a very beautiful thing in Buddhism, is that we don't, we try not to have any kind of enemies. Yeah, no one is our enemy. No one is someone that we hate or we have any problems with in the world. We try to deal with all the difficult people in a way whereby we can avoid having these very negative feelings towards other people. This is a beautiful thing. So what this means is that there is no one in the world we should have anger towards. Yeah, Even if you have someone you find very, very difficult or whatever, really, the Buddha says, there is no real excuse there. You should never excuse your anger because the moment you excuse your anger, you will not overcome it. You will encourage it and it will always be there. Instead, we should try to overcome it to all people in the world. 
I don't know who you, your favorite kind of, your least favorite person is in the world. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone you really don't like. Uh, maybe there is, maybe there's not. Uh, so this then is the opportunity to overcome that. Uh, and as a Buddhist, uh, we want to have that ability not to be angry with everyone, uh, to be able to get along in the world, uh, to deal with people in the good way. Sometimes we need to have compassion Sometimes people can be difficult. Yeah, it is true that people can be difficult. But just because they are difficult does not mean that we should have ill will towards them. We should deal with them in a different way. And usually the answer in those cases is to have compassion towards them. And when you are the kind of person who doesn't have ill will towards anyone, you become a real blessing for the world. Yeah, the world becomes so, so much more of a beautiful place. There's no argument with anyone. Other people may argue with you. Other people may not like you. So you think, okay, whatever, it is your problem. Yeah, if you don't like me, <laughs> be, my, be my guest. Not, you, don't have to, you, know, you don't have to be liked by everyone. And if everyone doesn't like us, it's okay. But I am not going to have that same feeling towards other people. There's something very beautiful about that. If you think about the history of sages around the world in all cultures have their idea of sages. The sage is someone who flows through the world, yeah? flows through the world in an even way. Yeah? Someone who doesn't get upset or angry almost ever, yeah? ideally never, but even if they do get angry sometimes, it is very, very rare. This is the idea of the sage. Yeah? The sage is someone who sees the world in a new way. Yeah? And the way they see the world is partly explained in this sutta here. We're going to see in a minute uh, what comes out of the sutta. Before we get to that, uh, let's have another short break. All right. So, okay. Venerable Sariputta. So now we have looked at the five kinds of people, and now we're going to look at each one of those persons in turn and see what how to deal with that. Yeah, and many of you will have heard the sutta many times before because I teach the sutta every time I do these kind of retreats. And I think it is really worthwhile. There are certain suttas I like to teach again and again and again because I know that they are incredibly useful for people. How do I know that? I know because they are useful for me. So if they're useful for me, they must be useful for others. That's what I kind of, that's my guess. <laughs> so uh, this is how it goes, yeah? How should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior by body is impure, but whose behavior by speech is pure? Suppose a monastic wearing rag robes sees a rag by the roadside. They will hold it down with the left foot, spread it out with the right foot, tear, tear out the, what is intact and take it away with them. In the same way, at that time, you should ignore the person's impure behavior by body and focus on the pure behavior by speech. That is how to get rid of resentment for that person. Yeah, so it's a very simple technique. It just teaches you how to learn to look for the right thing in people. And when you look for the good part in another person, well, then you will like them, you will enjoy that person, you will enjoy the company because you will see the good aspects in that person, yeah? It's very simple, but it also is very powerful and that is kind of the point here. Yeah? So here you have this idea of a mendicant, a monastic wearing rag robes, yeah? Kind of having everything is sewn together, all little rags and then kind of you make a robe out of rags. Okay. And then when you're wearing a rag robe and then you see a rag on the roadside and very, you know, if you are a rag robe wearing bhikkhu or bhikkhuni or whatever, you're always on the lookout for rags, yeah, because a rag, you can use it to patch your robe. If there's a hole, you can kind of mend it and fix it up. You're always on the, on the lookout for a rag. So then you walk along the road, you see, a, you see a discarded cloth on the side of the road. It's a rag, it's dirty, it's unpleasant, but you see it. So what do you do? Well, you take that rag with your foot, you hold down one side of the rag, you spread it out, yeah, and, the whole, and then you see the whole rag all the way across. And then you see which part of the rag is useful. 
which part you can sew into your robe and which part is rotten and dirty and useless. So you tear off, you tear off the useless section and you throw it out. Why? Because it's rubbish. You don't want to carry rubbish with you. You take, you throw it out. And then you take the good part and you take it maybe in your bag, you take it inside your robe and you carry it, carry it with you into the future. This is the idea, yeah? And uh, so it is exactly the same thing with other people. The idea is that you kind of spread the person out in your mind's eye. You see all the qualities, yeah? The really good qualities over here, the middling qualities over there, and the bad qualities over there. You think, yeah, this is the person. They have all of these qualities, some good, some bad. Yeah, here it talks about... Uh, Good by body, not bad by body, but good by speech. But you can think of this as a general idea of many kinds of qualities, yeah? So you look at all those qualities, and then you say, well, here are all the bad qualities. You tear it off at that point. You take those bad qualities, you crumble it up, you chuck it in the waste bin, or you flush it down the toilet, but you get rid of it. And then you take the good qualities that are over here, you fold them up nicely here and you take them into your heart and you carry them with you into the future. And next time you see that person, next time you meet them and maybe some of those bad qualities show themselves in that person. Well, what you do is you remember the good qualities. You have already thrown out the garbage. You have thrown out the bad qualities. You're not carrying those with you. But what you are carrying with you, you have reminded yourself, wow, this person has all these good qualities. So when you have difficulty with that person in the future, you bring out those good qualities and you remind yourself of all the goodness that is there. And then you rejoice in the goodness of that person. This is the idea. Yeah, this is how you do this. It's a very beautiful and simple way of uh, kind of uh, getting rid of the negative qualities. Uh, and you, perhaps you think, well, how, you know, how can we do this? Because if the bad qualities are there, we will see them. So how can we do this? Well, the idea here is that you, you build up the perception of good qualities. You think about that again and again. Uh, very often when we see people in life, we often focus on the bad qualities in other people. And we build up this idea that someone else is bad because all we do is focus on the bad qualities. But if we do the opposite and we start focusing on the good qualities, we're actually changing our perception of that person. They start to look better. They look like a different person. They no longer not look like this evil person anymore because we are for the first time, we are opening our eyes to the good qualities in that person. We're allowing that to dominate the way we think about them. We're changing our perspective. We're looking at things in a new way. And we start to think, actually, why am I always looking at the bad qualities when there are so many good things to see here? Wow, I should rejoice in all these good qualities. Sometimes they are generous. Sometimes they are kind. Sometimes they have a good thought. Yeah, all of these actually positive things in this person. I should rejoice in that uh, because it's wonderful that there are people in the world with all of these uh, good qualities. Uh, you're just shifting your attention from one thing to something else. Uh, and as you do that, you start to be more happy with that person. You see them a different way. And then you can forgive the bad qualities uh, because when you see all the good qualities, actually the bad qualities don't matter so much anymore. Uh, they become irrelevant. Uh, and because you can forgive the bad qualities, they don't really take up any space in your mind and you focus on the good in that person. And then what people say, they say, well, isn't that being fake? Isn't the idea on the Buddhist path to see things in accordance with reality? If we just see the good qualities in the person, we ignore the bad ones, aren't we just deceiving ourselves? Aren't we pretending that the world is one way when actually it is in a different way? Huh? And the answer to that question is that there isn't any way that the person is. Huh? We just see different aspects of the same person. Huh? One person, if, is, you, you may like someone huh? and another person might hate exactly the same person. Huh? Or you may not like someone, another person may like them. 
Why is that? Well, it's because we are looking at the person in different ways. So the answer is that there isn't really any way that other people are. You cannot say, this is the way this person is, this is the way they are not, this is the good and this is the bad, because there isn't any neutral ground. You know, there isn't any absolute truth about the person. When there is no self, all there is is changing qualities all the time. Maybe you can say at this moment they are generous, or at this moment they are angry. So you can maybe see the bad or good qualities for a short time, but you cannot make a judgment of the person. There isn't any neutral ground, objective truth that you can look at and say the person is like this. This is a very powerful insight. When you understand that there isn't any way that the person is, well, then you have to ask yourself another question, which is much more profound and much more beautiful. And that is, what is the best way of looking at that person so it leads to something positive for me and for the other person? What is the way of looking at them that leads to spiritual growth? If I cannot find the truth about them, if there is no truth about them, the right way of thinking about them is, well, what is beneficial in the long run? So it leads to my growth and the growth of people around me. This is why we look for the good qualities, because we know that when we see the good qualities in other people, we know that the result of that is that actually we are growing in metta, we're growing in loving kindness, we're getting less angry, we're seeing the world in a new way. This is why we should do it in this way. We should focus on the metta if we can, and we should avoid looking at the bad qualities if we can avoid it. So this is the idea here, yeah? the idea of seeing the good, throwing out the rubbish, taking the good qualities with us and carrying those good qualities with us into the future. This is what this is really all about. It's a beautiful way of learning how to think about other people differently. Let's have a look at the second person. How should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior by way of speech is impure, but whose behavior by body is pure? Suppose there was a lotus pond covered with moss and aquatic plants. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. They would plunge into the lotus pond, sweep away the moss and the aquatic plants, drink from their cupped hands, and be on their way. In the same way, at that time, you should ignore the person's impure behavior by speech and focus on their pure behavior by body. That is how to get rid of resentment for that person. Yeah, so this is a very similar to the previous one. It's the same kind of problem. Now there is uh, impurity by speech and purity by body. The other time it was the reverse, but basically it's the same thing. And what, one of the things that this means is that sometimes the quality in a person changes. Yeah, So we have to follow along as the qualities change. We look at things in a different way. So similar kind of idea as before, yeah? There is a lotus pond covered with moss and all of this algae, yeah? The aquatic plants. And uh, the lotus pond is the person, yeah? So the lotus pond is the person, the moss and the algae that uh, the person has, these are all the bad qualities in the person, yeah? So there is this lotus pond, there is this person there, yeah? Full of, person that's full of moss and full of algae. This is how you can think of that person. Yeah? And then comes another person. Yeah, it is very hot. So you are struggling because it is hot. And remember the idea of heat here. The heat very often is symbolizes the idea of being angry. Yeah, when you are angry about something or you are, have ill will about something, it's like your mind is hot. It is hot because it is agitated. It is um, restless. It is moving very fast. It's thinking about things. Yeah, they did this to me. It's really bad. And you feel this heat inside when you have the, when you get angry about something. Yeah. So you are oppressed by the heat and you are weary because when you get angry and upset about things, you lose your energy. 
your energy, well, at, 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 right away you have energy. When you get angry, you get very energetic straight away. Yeah? But after a while, you start to get weary. After a while, you lose your energy. Yeah? And after, when the anger kind of drops, uh, sometimes you just want to go to sleep because, <laughs> because the energy is all gone. Huh? And then you are thirsty and parched. And the idea of being thirsty here is this idea of looking for a solution. Huh? If you want to get a... Uh, get away from the heat, you want to get away from the weariness, uh, you want to drink something cool and nice uh, to overcome the problem. Yeah? So this is showing us the path to the solution. You are thirsty, you want to find a solution to this thing. Yeah? And so what do you do? You plunge into the lotus pond. Uh, the lotus pond is the other person, so you, like you plunge into the other person. Yeah? And when you plunge into them, it's like you see all their qualities again. It's the idea of plunging into the person. You see what is actually there. And when you see what is there, you sweep away the bad qualities. You sweep away the moss and all the aquatic plants. You sweep away all the algae that is on the surface. Why? Because it's rubbish. You don't want to have all of those moss and things. It is just a problem. So you sweep it away here. And then you take the good water underneath, uh, the beautiful water underneath, uh, and you drink it. And because you drink it, you are taking in your mind all the good qualities of that person in the same way as last time. Uh, and then when you have those qualities inside, taking them on board in your mind, here symbolized by drinking the water, then you are on your way and you carry these things with you into the future. So the idea, again, of learning how to see the good in other people, uh, learning to let go of the bad qualities, uh, and if you're hard to let go, then you can at least forgive. Uh, yeah? You can understand that people are under the sway of habits. Uh, they are under the sway of past conditioning. Uh, okay, fine, I forgive you. What a wonderful thing it is that you have good qualities. Yeah? What a wonderful thing it is that you are my friend, yeah, that you are my friend here at the BGF or wherever you are in the world, and you are someone I can rely on, like someone I can trust, because I know that you keep the five precepts. Sometimes you keep the eight precepts. Sometimes you are kind and generous. What a wonderful thing it is to have friends like that. Okay, you make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. I, have, I haven't seen you make any mistakes because uh, I only see you so rarely, so I never get the chance to see a mistake. But I know that you make mistakes. I make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. That's okay. We can allow each other to make mistakes because when we see the big picture, when we see the intention to be kind, when we see the intention to be gentle, when we see the intention to be a blessing for the world, wow, what a wonderful thing that is. And I sometimes, I'm very fortunate, I'm a Buddhist monk. Being a Buddhist monk is the best thing in the world. Nothing is better than being a Buddhist monk, you know. This is number one, occupation. If you want a really good occupation, become a Buddhist monk. It has the highest pay, yeah? You gain real happiness, real satisfaction. There's no messing around. This is the best kind of work you can ever have. All you have to do, hang out with other good people. Your fellow monks are other good people. Hang out with really nice lay people like all the lay people coming here. How can you have any better work than that when all you do is good things and happy things and joyful things? And sometimes I think about my fellow monks and I look at them and I think, actually, I'm really fortunate to be living with such high-minded people. People like Ajahn Brahm, people like all the other monks in this monastery who are really trying their very best to live really well. What a wonderful thing that is. Sometimes they make mistakes. Sometimes they are not perfect. We are, no, no one is perfect all the time, maybe with the exception of the Arahant or the Buddha or whatever, but no one else is perfect all the time. So you, that's okay. At the very least, you are trying. At the very least, you are a very good person. Wow, I really appreciate you. Thank you for being a fellow monastic in this particular monastery here. So appreciate the people in your life, yeah? All the people who come on a retreat like this, uh, all the people you hang out with, these are really good people. Uh. No one would bother coming to a retreat like this. Uh. No one would bother listening to these teachings uh, unless they were intending to live well. Uh. That's why people come here. So well done, uh, yeah? Wonderful to have you here because uh, 
if you weren't, if you, you're coming here for the good reason. So it's marvelous to have you here as a companion in the spiritual life. Welcome. So think like that about your fellows in the spiritual life. See the big picture. Forget about the small imperfections. Then you're going to be on the right track. Let's have a look at the next person now. And how should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior by way of body and speech is impure, but who gets an opening and clarity of the heart from time to time? Suppose there was a little water in a cow's hoof print. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. They might think it. This little bit of water is in a cow's hoof print. If I drink it with my cupped hands or a bowl, I'll stir it and disturb it, making it undrinkable. Why don't I get down on all fours and drink it up like a cow, then be on my way? So that is what they do. In the same way, at that time, you should ignore that person's impure behavior by way of speech and body and focus on the fact that they get an openness and clarity of the heart from time to time. That is how to get rid of resentment for that person. So here we have a person who has a, a lot of bad behavior, yeah, bad by body, bad by speech. But what they do have, they have this idea of the openness and the clarity of the heart. And the openness of the heart here, the idea, the word here is the vivarana is the word. And vivarana is the opposite of the nivarana. The nivarana are the hindrances, right? And the five hindrances that we have in meditation practice, well, they, that is ill will, that is desire, it is the the tiredness and lethargy, the restlessness and remorse and the doubt. So these are all the things that cloud the mind and make the mind kind of small and narrow, make the mind unwieldy, make the mind not really fit for meditation practice. So what we're talking about here, when the Pali word vivarana, and I think uh, pasada is the clarity of the heart, uh, what we're talking about is someone who has a good mind state, uh, someone who has a mind state where they are really mindful, someone who has a mindset where maybe they are practicing samadhi, they're having success in the meditation. Even though their body and speech is bad, they have the inner clarity sometimes still. Yeah? So when you observe somebody, well, then you should observe very carefully. Because what you may find is that what we see on the surface actually is not the full picture of that person. There's more going on behind the surface. There are good qualities there. And if we can, we should always see those good qualities. And this is the idea of the simile of the cow's hoof print. Yeah? There's a cow's hoof print and there's a you know, tiny amount of, of water in a cow's hoof print. It's not going to be much. And then comes this person again, the person who is angry and weary and all of these kind of things, oppressed by the heat, yeah? And they come along and they see a tiny bit of water. The tiny bit of water is the good qualities in the other person. There's only a tiny amount of, of water there and the majority is bad qualities. And so they think, well, if I am not very careful, if I try to use my hands to drink it or whatever, if I use a coarse method of get in the water, I will just disturb it. I will make it undrinkable. So you have to get down on all fours. You have to lie down on your tummy, yeah? And then suck the water up, just like a cow sucks up water. In the same way, when someone has only a small amount of good qualities, you have to focus very narrowly here. You have to see those good qualities. You cannot look too much that way. You cannot look too much that way. Because if you do, you will see the bad things. You focus very narrowly on those good qualities. And then you see those. You think, wow, it's amazing. Even though this person has bad qualities in this way and that way, they still have some good qualities within them. That is really worthy of respect. Someone who attains samadhi, someone who has, attains real spiritual profundity in this world, they are really worthy of respect. I will respect that. May this person be happy and well. 
And then you focus on those good qualities. You focus on the good mind and you don't allow the bad qualities by body and speech to disturb you. So what we are seeing here is that we should go a long way towards having metta towards other people. If we can find any kind of good quality in a person, if there's anything there that is worthy of respect, we should focus on that. And we should feel so happy that we're able to find good qualities in the other person. Why should we try so hard? And I think the, the reason why we should try so hard is because metta is always a very, very positive quality. If you have metta towards someone else, it means that you are friendly towards them. It means you wish them well. It means that you have a good feeling about the other person. What does it mean to have a good friend? A good friend is someone you can relax with, someone you can joke with. Yeah, When you have a good friend, it is someone you see the good qualities in. This is kind of the idea of a good friend. The word metta is related to the idea of mitta. Mitta means like a good friend. Yeah, So metta is someone... Uh, is other qualities, the feelings you have towards a friend in this way. So um, uh, we should go as far as we possibly can to have metta for other people, because this quality inside when we have metta is actually a very beautiful quality and is very, very useful on the spiritual path. When you have metta towards other people, you will be kind to them. You will speak in the right way. You will act in the right way and you will develop really well on the spiritual path. If you don't have metta towards them, then well, the alternative is to have karuna. Karuna is compassion. Yeah, that is the other way of dealing with people. So uh, if you don't have metta, then you can have compassion. The problem is that if you have compassion, compassion can more easily go wrong. Yeah? Because when we have compassion towards somebody, compassion is often wishing people freedom from suffering. Yeah, this is what compassion is about. You want to help someone out of suffering. Yeah. This is the problem with compassion. It is too closely related with suffering. Yeah. And because it is so closely related with suffering, yeah, it is always, it is, can easily happen that you lose the focus. Yeah. And then instead of uh, wishing them well, wishing them happiness, you see the suffering. And when you see the suffering too much, uh, you can lose your energy uh, and you can lose your ability to have compassion. Instead, you become immersed in that suffering and you become maybe depressed and sad because all you see is suffering around you. So compassion is more tricky. And because compassion is more tricky, it is actually better to focus on metta if at all possible. Uh, and I will give you an example of why compassion can be so hard. And this is a, was an example I heard. And this is from Buddhist circle. These are good Buddhist people, right? But because they are good, good Buddhist people and they don't have a balance in their practice, that lack of balance leads to often not really being able to practice properly. And this was a, a practice that they do apparently in the Tibetan tradition. And this practice in the Tibetan tradition, the idea is that you take on all the suffering in the world. And then when you take on all the suffering in the world, the idea then is that you have empathy, you have understanding for the world around you. But what these people found who were doing this kind of practice is that when you take on all the suffering in the world, you drain all your energy. You drain all the good feelings inside and you just end up feeling sad and depressed. And then you cannot act anymore at all. You lose all your spiritual uplift, all your ability to do good in life. You lose that because you have taken on too much suffering. All you see is this negative side of humanity, all the suffering. And this is the danger if you want to practice in the right way. This is the, this is the wrong way to practice because the idea here is this is there to energize us is to make us feel uplifted, to feel happy within. So this is the danger of compassion. Take it the wrong way. And if you take it the wrong way, then it will lead to negative consequences instead of the positive consequences. This is why metta is so important. And this is why the Buddha here, or this is Venerable Sariputta, he goes so far in the idea of metta, even if there's a tiny bit of good qualities, focus on those build those up, be happy that these qualities are there, rejoice in them, yeah? And then you are on the right track, yeah? I should 
maybe also point out that one of the kind of strange things about this passage, it says that someone is bad by body and bad by speech, and still they get some good samadhi. It seems unfair. Yeah, we are trying so hard to live well, to be, uh, you know, live well by body and speak in the right way. And here is some scallywag, some dodgy character doing all the bad things, and still they get good samadhi. Yeah, how fair is that? That's really unfair, isn't it? So why, why is this happening? Why is this happening here? And the reason why it is happening is because our personalities are so complex. Yeah, we come from a past and maybe in the past life, maybe we had some good meditation and then maybe we had some bad conditioning in this life. So we become bad by body and speech. But because of the conditioning from a past life, we still have the ability to have samadhi inside. Yeah. So sometimes it is possible to combine external bad behavior with internal samadhi. Of course, if they keep on being bad like this, if they keep on doing bad things by body and speech, eventually they will lose that samadhi. Eventually it will be gone because these things can only coexist for so long, right? But it is possible for a short time. And because it is possible for a short time, maybe a few years or whatever, see those good qualities because as long as they are there there is something positive to focus on in that person this does not mean that wish that good speech and good uh, actions don't matter of course they matter in the long run good speech and good bodily action is going to give rise to samadhi yeah eventually they will have an effect inside and then it will work yeah but in the short run these kind of uh, uh, anomalies can happen. And for that reason, we should be very careful with judging people too fast. Uh, we should have an open mind. Uh, we should try to see the deeper aspect of the person. If we judge people too fast, uh, we are just bringing, down, bringing our own downfall as a consequence. Uh, so be very, very careful with judgment. Uh, see what is there, uh, but don't judge too fast. Uh, then you'll be doing the right thing here. Yeah. Let's take another few minutes of meditation here. Uh. Okay, so we have just had a look at the various ways of looking at people uh, uh, who have at least a little bit of good qualities. Uh, yeah, so we have seen people with good qualities. Uh. But then there are people who don't have any good qualities. Yeah? And the question then is, well, what do we do if a person has no good qualities? Uh, that is the next thing that comes up. So let's have a look at the, this particular case. How, how should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior by body and speech is impure and who does not get an openness or clarity of the heart from time to time? So this is a person whose all the qualities in this person are bad. You cannot see any good qualities in this person. So what should we do? So this is the answer. Suppose a person was traveling along a road and they were sick, suffering and gravely ill. And it was a long way to the next village, whether ahead or behind. They didn't have any suitable food or medicine or a competent care or someone to bring them within the village. Then another person traveling along the same road would see them and they would think of them as no, with nothing but compassion, kindness and sympathy. Oh, may this person get suitable food or medicine or a competent carer or someone to bring them within a village. Why is that? So that they don't come to ruin right there. In the same way, at that time when someone is bad speech, bad body, and also bad mind, at that time you should ignore that person's impurity, impure behavior by body and speech. And you should ignore the fact that they don't get an openness of the mind or clarity of the heart from time to time. And you should think of them with nothing but compassion, kindness, and sympathy. Oh, may this person give up the bad conduct by by way of body, speech, and mind. 
May they develop good conduct by way of body, speech, and mind. Why is that? So when the body breaks up after death, they are not reborn in a place of loss, a bad place, the underworld in hell. That is how you get resentment, get rid of resentment for that person. And this, I think, is just very powerful. Yeah, it's a very beautiful way of thinking about people. There are always people in our life that we find very difficult. You may not be able to see any good qualities. Yeah? When you hear that someone is scamming the money that you may have given to a good cause, well, it's very hard to see the good qualities in a person like that. But there is a way out, and this is the way out, the way of compassion. Now, the first thing to be aware of here, yeah, when you judge another person in this way and you kind of think that they have no good qualities, the first thing to be aware of is that we don't actually know whether the other person has good qualities or not. What we see is always a very limited part of the other person. We see aspects of the per other person. We don't see the whole personality. Maybe there are good qualities there that we cannot see. And this is a very important point because what that means is that when we judge somebody in this way, we don't judge in an absolute sense. We don't say once and for all, this is a bad and evil person. What we do say is that right now, I cannot see any good qualities right now. All I can see is bad qualities, but you leave open the possibility that they may change. Yeah, maybe in the future, they will become different. So you don't make any absolute judgment. All you do is you know that right now, I cannot see any good qualities. And because right now I cannot see the good qualities, it means that I will have to have compassion rather than metta for that person. And this way of thinking is an act of kindness to other people. Because if we define people and we say, this is an evil person, and we put them in the evil box, yeah, so now they are evil forever after, it means that we don't give them the chance to change. Yeah? It's like we have written them off once and for all, never giving them the chance to actually become a better person. So by saying that, okay, I'm not going to judge you once and for all, that is an act of kindness to the other person. When they change, we accept, okay, they have changed. Now I will think about them in a new way and I will treat them in a different way. Maybe I will not avoid them so much anymore. Maybe they can become a friend or whatever after all because they have changed. This is very important because sometimes if we judge other people unfairly, they may feel trapped. Yeah? They may feel trapped by your judgment. You know what it is like if other people judge you very harshly and they say, yeah, you are just a bad person. It feels really unfair. And it's almost like as if we are trapped by the judgment of the other person. It's as if we cannot, there's no escape from that judgment. And it feels very unfair. And sometimes what happens if other people judge you harshly, you don't care about being kind anymore. Yeah, because you think, okay, whatever, they have judged me harshly anyway. Yeah? In the same way, if you judge someone else too harshly, it means that you don't really give them the opportunity to become kind, to become a good person. It's much more difficult for them to be kind if they feel judged in a very harsh way by you. So we should always be open to other people. We should always allow them to change. We should allow them to show other good sides of themselves. Yeah? And when we do that and we encourage that, we're actually encouraging the goodness inside of every person around us. We should never make a final judgment of anybody in the whole world, always giving that opportunity to change, to become a different person. It's an act of supreme compassion and kindness when we do that. So this is the first thing to remember. Yeah, Don't box people in too much. And then the second thing to remember is, is, is this here, yeah? what the Buddha is saying here, that someone who is bad by body, speech, and mind, they are sick, they are ill, they have this illness inside. They don't even understand very often that they have this illness inside, the illness of anger, the illness of bad qualities, the illness that lead to long-term suffering and problems. It is right there within them. And of course, how do you deal with that ill person? 
you deal with them with compassion. Yeah, you try to find a way to help them. So if you find someone who is really bad and you think that there is a possibility of helping them, you try to help them. What do you do? You try to find the suitable food and medicine. Yeah, from a Buddhist point of view, what is that suitable food and medicine? It is the Dhamma. It is telling the person, wait, and listen, you're just creating suffering for yourself. Do you really want to create suffering for yourself? You're creating suffering for others. You're also creating suffering for yourself. Listen, feel what it feels like to do bad things. It feels bad. Don't do bad things. You're bringing the Dhamma into their life. This is why bringing the Dhamma to someone else is the greatest gift we can give anyone. Because when we bring them the Dhamma, we are bringing them the light. We're bringing them the way to see the world in a different way, to give them happiness and give them a way out of suffering. This is what we're doing to this person, showing them the path forward. We're finding a competent carer for them. The competent carer is the Buddha. The competent carer are the noble people in the world, the Aryas. The competent carer are us, we who understand the Dhamma, who can help them in the right direction. Yeah? And then we bring them within the village. The village is like the Buddhist community. The village are the Kalyanamitas. The village are all the good people coming together, showing them the way forward. The village may even be the monastic life, yeah, the monastic community. Then they are given a chance. And then they are given the opportunity to actually go in the right way. But very often what you will find is that people who are very bad, who have many bad qualities, they don't want to listen. They're not interested in what you have to say. And if they're not interested in what you have to say, what you have to do is you have to, sometimes we have to keep a little bit of distance because some people are just too difficult to be with. So please don't be afraid of keeping distance sometimes because sometimes it is necessary. But you can always have compassion even from a distance. Yeah, you can understand, wow, I wish I could help this person. If I get the opportunity in the future, I will help. But actually, this person is in real trouble. They are sick. They are walking in darkness. They think they are creating happiness for themselves. But actually, they're, all they're doing is creating suffering for themselves. Everybody in the world wants to create happiness for themselves. But we don't understand how we do it. Some people think that by doing bad things, by living in a bad way, they will somehow create happiness. But they are deluded. They don't understand cause and effect. They don't understand the ideas of karma. They don't understand how your actions right now affects how you feel about yourself right in this moment. They are blind. They are walking inside a dark forest, hitting the head against the branches of the trees, stubbing the foot in the roots on the ground, always hurting themselves because they are in darkness. This is the right way to think about these people. The problem is that we are often we are so self-centered. Yeah, we think about ourselves. We feel how this other person is, um, uh, is always hurting us in one way. And we think, me, yeah, they are hurting me. They are bad. And so we think about ourselves too much. And then that is why we get angry with the other person, because we think they are hurting us. But um, this is the wrong way of thinking. Yeah, maybe they are hurting you. But the reason why they are hurting you is not because you, it is because this is their character. The problem is not with you. The problem is actually with the other person. They would act in that way, even if you were not there, they will still act like that. This is just their personality. This is their conditioning. They cannot stop themselves from acting in this way. The conditioning is so strong. The weird thing is that many people who are bad, they actually want to be good. They know that goodness is right, but they can't stop themselves because the condition is, conditioning is so strong. Ask yourself whether you would like to be kind all the time, and you would probably say, yes, I'd like to be kind all the time. But still, you get angry. Why? Because you cannot stop it. 
because the conditioning overrides what you actually want to do. And with these people, this is very, very deep seated. So when you think about the person in that way, yeah, it is not personal. It is not about you, it is about them. They are the one who have the problem. You just have to deal with it for a short time, then you are rid of it. Instead of having this feeling, this is me, me, me. Yeah, they are hurting me. <laughs> this is how we often feel, right? And that world, when you are self-centered, when you're thinking about yourself, is a small world. It's a painful world, whether it's you against everyone else. It is my little world against the dangerous world out there. That is a painful state of existence. So instead of doing that, you open up your heart. You take in the difficult people in the world. You have a greater degree of compassion as a consequence. And suddenly everything opens up. It is no longer you against the world. You embrace everyone, even the people who are really difficult. You have compassion. You have a sense of kindness for them inside. You don't necessarily have anything to deal with them because it is too difficult. So you have compassion at the distance. Nevertheless, you have compassion. So this is the idea of how to deal with difficult people. Yeah, the idea that you understand that they don't know what they are doing. They are like machines. They are like robots. And the program in that robot that runs that machine, which is the other person, was written long, long time ago. Yeah, maybe in past lives, maybe a long, long, long time ago. And now, because that program was written a long, long time ago, that program is playing itself out. And they are forced to have behavior that they don't want to have. I don't know about you, but I sometimes look at myself and I think there's many things in my behavior that I would ideally like to change, yeah? But then I see myself often doing the same things again and again. I am changing, of course, because you change when you live the monastic life. But you can see how you are trapped in your own personality. You're trapped in your own habits. You're trapped in your own way of being. You can't really get out of that, yeah? We are trapped by the conditioning from the past. And when we understand that we are trapped, other people are trapped, then we can have compassion for others, but we can also have compassion for ourselves. This is kind of the, what it really comes down to when you start to feel, actually, I am trapped by this personality. I didn't choose this personality. I came into this world. I was brought up by my parents and I went to school and I lived in a certain society and I became who I am. Am I responsible for this? Well, <laughs> how responsible are we for our personality? It comes like a big package deal. You are delivered to you. This is your personality. And then you are trapped by that. You cannot step out of it. And then you become Worried, well, if the personality is a trap, then what can I do? Well, what you can do is to gradually develop yourself out of that trap. This is the whole purpose of the spiritual path. Gradually, we emerge from it. And that gradual emergence, one of the big parts and parcel of that emergence is precisely to have compassion, compassion for the whole world. Compassion for the Russian soldiers who are invading Ukraine. Why are they invading Ukraine? Well, probably these are very young men, maybe in their early 20s, maybe around 20 years older. And then maybe they didn't have a good job. It can be very difficult to get a good job in a place like Russia. And so they thought, okay, I'll join the military. It will be a nice job. They never thought they would have to actually fight or kill anyone, right? But of course, if you join the military, that is, may happen. This is part of the problem of joining the military. And then the government and the generals, they tell you, okay, you have joined the military. Now you have to fight in Ukraine. I don't want to fight in the Ukraine. Go and fight in the Ukraine. We have paid you to do this. And they have no choice. And then they are forced into a situation which is terrible, yeah? And there is pressure around you to kill. There's pressure around you to do all kinds of atrocities and horrible things. What are you going to do? You don't have any choice. And then you understand why we should have compassion for these people. Because they are trapped 
Yes, you can argue is a trap of their own making because they joined the military, but it's very easy to condemn other people like that. Often it is very difficult for these people to find an alternative. You have to make a living. You have to support your family. What are you going to do? Then you have compassion for the soldiers who are invading a place like Ukraine. What about the generals? Surely the generals, they are more in command, right? The higher up you go in the army, the more power you have. Well, actually, maybe not. Yeah, Maybe you have more power, but you are trapped in your own way. Once you are part of the military, once you have been brainwashed by that military through decades of being part of it, you don't have any say anymore. You are brainwashed to believe these things. And because you are brainwashed to believe these things, you end up doing lots of really bad things. What about someone like Vladimir Putin at the very top of the hierarchy? What about him? Well, he too is somehow conditioned, right? He is now in a position of power. That position of power also traps you in a certain way. He is probably foolish. He probably doesn't really understand the consequences of what, you're, what he's doing. He doesn't understand the downfall, the terrible things that may happen to him in the future. I don't think he believes in rebirth. And because he doesn't believe in rebirth, maybe he thinks there will be no consequences after he dies. So, but even Vladimir Putin is trapped in darkness. He's trapped in delusion. Even the very top of the hierarchy has a problem. Even the top of the hierarchy is in the end worthy of compassion. So you can see here how compassion is this tool that everyone is worthy of. The people who are killed in Ukraine, of course, they are worthy of an enormous amount of compassion because they are invaded against their will. But it's not just the victims that are worthy of compassion. The perpetrators, the soldiers too, all the way up the hierarchy, all the way to the very top. And when we think in this way, there is no one in the whole world we cannot have compassion towards. It's beautiful, yeah? Anger is crazy. Anger doesn't make any sense. Compassion all the way through is always the right approach. Let's have a look at the last person here. How should you get rid of resentment for a person whose behavior by way of body and speech is pure and who gets an opening and clarity of the heart from time to time? Suppose there was a lotus pond with clear, sweet, cool water, clean with smooth banks, delightful and shaded by many trees. Then along comes a person struggling in the oppressive heat, weary, thirsty, and parched. They would plunge into the lotus pond to bathe and drink, and after emerging, they would sit down right there in the shade of the trees. In the same way, at that time, you should focus on that person's pure behavior by body and by speech, and the fact that they get an openness of the, and clarity of the heart from time to time. That is how to get rid of resentment for that person, relying on a person who is impressive all around, the mind becomes confident. So here we have the idea of a person who is a saint. Yeah, they are perfect, they're really good by body, bodily action, really good by verbal action. Uh, and they also get a good samadhi, they get this openness of the heart, yeah? the freedom from hindrances, uh, the clarity of the heart when the mind is clear, 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 clear. And you can enter all of these wonderful states of samadhi and probably you will also have the deep insights. You will be an arahant perhaps, uh, or at least you will be an Arya, this kind of person. So here we're dealing with the really good person. And of course, the problem is that even if someone is really good, it doesn't mean that we don't get angry with them. We all, people even get angry with people who are saints. Yeah? But in this case, the way to deal with that is quite easy. In this case, there is a lotus pond with a beautiful water, clear, sweet, cool water, clean and smooth banks. Yeah? 
In other words, there's no algae here, there's no moss, there are no water plants at all. It is just pure water all the way through. Yeah, because the person is full of good qualities. And then you have this idea that the banks around are smooth, delightful and shaded by many kind of trees. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is that uh, uh, when someone is a very good person, being around that person is delightful. Yeah, you feel at ease in the company of that kind of person. You feel good in the company because you is like they radiate. They have an aura of goodness about them. Yeah, it's like when you, as I mentioned yesterday, when you sit down in the company of certain people, it's like that you just absorb the good vibes. Yeah, these are the good vibes of other people. You hang out with Ajahn Ganha, or you hang out with Ajahn Ganha, or maybe with Ajahn Brahm, or maybe with the Buddha, or I don't know what. And then you just hang out and you kind of feel all the good qualities of this person. It's like osmosis that kind of goes into your body. You have no choice. You cannot stop these things from happening. To you. This is the idea of hanging out with the saints. Yeah. Anyway, in the beginning, you don't do that. In the beginning, you are just struggling in the oppressive heat. You are angry, right? You're trying to find a solution. And of course, what you do is you plunge into that lotus pond. You plunge into that person. You drink up all the good qualities of that person. Yeah. And when you drink them up into your mind or whatever, then you carry those good qualities with you into the future. So in this case, it is so easy because in this case, uh, the good qualities are so obvious. Yeah, as you take those good qualities in there. And when you start to see the good qualities in the other person, the next thing that you do is that you become a disciple of that person. After you emerge, you sit and lie down right there in the shade of the trees. You become a disciple of that person. You hang out with them. You learn from them. And then you too gradually purify yourself in the same way by living with a person like this. So that's why yeah, you focus on the good qualities of this other person. And then you stop having resentment towards them. And then relying on that person who is impressive all around Impressive all around is Samantha Pasadika. It means that they are, they are uh, impressive or they are um, uh, just w- wonderful yeah, in all possible ways. Uh, Pasadika means like inspirational. Yeah? In, they are inspirational in so many ways. Uh, when you see an inspirational person, the mind becomes confident. Uh, and this is one of those great things about the Buddhist world. Uh, the Buddhist world, we still have people in, in the Buddhist world who are very inspiring, who have practiced the path all the way to the very end. Uh, there are still arahants living in the world. Uh, that's what I say anyway. It's hard to be sure, but that's the way it seems to me. We still have arahants in the world. Uh, and because we have uh, arahants in the world, sometimes you meet these people uh, and you look at them and you say, wow, this is very inspiring. Uh, You see someone who is different from what you are. You see someone who has abandoned maybe the bad and the crooked ways of ordinary people. Someone who has achieved a degree of kindness, a degree of eliminating anger and negative qualities that you never see in the world. Most people in the world are so um, mixed up with good and bad qualities. And then you see someone who has almost all good qualities. And when you see that, it opens up your eyes. You see a possibility. You see something that is not normal in the world. And when you see something that is not not normal in the world, it opens your eyes to the possibility of the spiritual path. This is why it is so useful to have arahants in the world, yeah? Because they give you access to a deeper truth. A truth that otherwise is very, very hard to see here. Seeing someone who has practiced the path to the end is an incredibly great benefit for ordinary human beings because it gives us access through experience to these teachings, even if it is not our immediate experience. If you just read the suttas, it can be difficult to see this because the suttas are often It's just paper, yeah? It's just a screen. Right now it's a screen, it's not paper, but whatever. 
it's just screen. And, and yes, it may be inspiring, but it's hard to really know if this inspirational texts are real, whether they really give rise to the results that they claim. It can be very hard to know that. So when you see the reality here, when you see people actually acting in this way, it's incredibly powerful and it helps you to push you in the right direction. So then the last thing the Buddha, not the Buddha, when the Bosari Putta says, he says that a mendicant should use these five methods to completely get rid of resentment when it has arisen towards anyone. No more resentment. Resentment is not required. We can have either metta or compassion in all cases in our life. This is what Venerable Sariputta is saying. So we have been looking at these ideas about how to overcome anger and ill will. And to my mind, these are some of the very powerful ideas on the Buddhist path. And I would really recommend you to think about these things clearly, because if you use these things in the right way, they can become incredibly powerful tools on how to overcome these things. And uh, when you do, this is where you really start to feel that there is an impact on your life, there's an impact on your spiritual development when you do these kind of things. So, so very useful. And you will see it is a mixture on the one hand of right view, thinking about people in the right way. On the other hand, there is a fair amount of effort that goes into this. Yeah? You have to try to think in this way. You have to turn your mind in the right direction. You have to, so this idea of effort and right view coming together again. Uh, this is kind of what uh, lies, be, lies behind, what is part of this practice. Uh, so now let us go on to the next sutta. There's going to be more 